Today we're going to talk about how these ideas about evolution um, look as computations and how we can use computation to understand and leverage evolutionary ideas. Let's first review the three basic elements of Darwinian evolution, which you've already learned about. Um, random variation of individuals, uh, selection of some of those individuals based on um, differential fitness, and the inheritance of those variations into individuals of the next generation. We also need to think a little bit about how those variations are represented. And that really gets us into the field of genetics. And uh, we don't need to know very much about genetics. We just need to know that the information, these, these variations are represented as discrete units, which today are called genes. And we need to know that the representation of the individual, uh, of the in information in genes is separate from how it's expressed in the phenotype. And so we refer to this as the genotype versus phenotype mapping. And the final thing we need to know is that these genes are organized in a linear array, uh, which today we call a chromosome. And this, um, this understanding really started with Mendel in 1865, and the culmination of it was the Crick and Watson uh, uh, discovery of the um, structure of DNA. So we're going to take those very simple elements and simple understandings and translate them into a computer algorithm. And the way we're going to do that is instead of having chromosomes with genes on them, we're going to have strings with bits. Bits are uh, numbers that are either 0 or 1. They can only have two values. And we're going to have those strings of bits be our individuals in the population. So imagine that we start out, and this is in the leftmost um, panel of the figure. Imagine that we start out with a population of randomly generated individuals or strings. And here we only have three shown, and they each only have five bits. But in real genetic algorithms, we would have more bits and larger populations. We also need a way to evaluate fitness, and we do that using a fitness function. In our fitness, our example fitness function, we will assume that the values uh, range from 0 to 1, and that one, the higher value 1 is the one that, that is better. So the first step after, well, the first step is generate the, in the, the initial population. Then we need to evaluate each individual in the population using our fitness function and use those fitness values to select the next generation. And so you see that in the center panel where we have two copies of the highest fitness individual, no copies of the low in, lowest fitness individual, and a single copy of the average individual. That's not very interesting because those individuals look exactly like their parents. And so we take advantage of what are known as genetic operators to introduce new variations. And we do that using a mutation that's shown in the top individual where the, uh, the first, first bit, a 1, is uh, flipped to become a 0. And we do this not always in the first position. We do it randomly at different places in the string and do it randomly throughout um, the strings of the, of the population. Then we also use a, pr a process called crossover or recombination where we take two individuals and exchange pieces of their of their uh, DNA or pieces of their bit strings. And you see that in the second two individuals. So now in the third panel, we have the, the true new generation, generation T plus 1. And uh, we, need to, we then have to repeat the cycle and evaluate those using the fitness function, introduce, do new selection, introduce new mutations and crossovers. And that is how the evolutionary process runs. This basic strategy and basic idea of using uh, strings, bit strings, to represent chromosomes was um, introduced by John Holland in the early 1960s. And John, ha um, John was very interested in the population level effects and in the effect of, uh, impact of crossover. OK, but now coming back to the algorithm. Um, what does it look like when we actually run this algorithm for multiple generations? So I just showed you one generation in the previous slide, but 
we typically iterate these for hundreds or th even thousands sometimes of generations. And the way we look at it um, is by plotting time in terms of numbers of generations on the x-axis and the fitness, typically the average fitness of the population or the best fitness of the population. Those are the two values shown here um, on the y-axis. And so this is a very typical kind of performance curve that we see with genetic algorithms where the fitness of the population starts out very low initially, very quickly uh, climbs up and improves as the, the really lousy individuals get deleted and the somewhat better individuals get copied. So then the whole average fitness moves up. Then there's a little bit of searching around that we see and uh, we get another innovation, but eventually the population gets stuck on what's known as a plateau. This is known as punctuated equilibrium. And when that happens, then the algorithm is effectively having to explore the space more widely to find a good, um, a, a high fitness innovation. And so that can take a varying amount of time. And we see, uh, we actually see two plateaus, but at w the first plateau that we see in the figure, um, we see eventually a new innovation is found and, and the population jumps up in fitness. And this is very typical of these genetic algorithms. Let's now talk about uh, some applications, how they're used. And genetic algorithms have been used widely in engineering applications, and they've also been used for scientific modeling. First, we'll talk about the engineering applications, and of these, by far the most common is, the, is what's known as multi-parameter function optimization. So that's shown in the figure where, uh, just for a two-dimensional function, that is a function in two variables. And if the function is complex, a lot of times we don't have um, analytical methods to fi find mathematically what the maximum value of the function is. And when that happens, we have to resort to sampling. And we can think of the genetic algorithm as a kind of biased sampling algorithm. And the goal, of course, would be to find um, in this multi-peaked surface, find points that are on the highest peak up at the top. Let's just go into a little bit more detail about how that works. So um, here is an example of such a function, and it's not trivial to analyze this mathematically, but suppose we want to find the x and y values for this function that produce the maximum f of xy. So to do that, we take our bit strings and conceptually think of the first half of the string as represent being a representation of the value of x, and the second half of the string is being a representation of the value of y. Now to evaluate fitness, we then need to take these uh, ones and zeros and interpret them as base two numbers, translating them into their decimal equivalents, which is shown on the figure, and then take those decimal values and plug them into our, our uh, function, our fitness function, and in this case we get the value out four. And so we would have to do that for every individual in the population. I just want to say a word about where these algorithms came from. I've mentioned John Holland. There were uh, several other groups that were interested in similar kinds of algorithms. And, and they, th these three main groups I've listed, the first three, are, uh, were all sort of independent discoveries of similar and overlapping ideas. And then in the early 1990s, John Koza came along and really blew open the field by um, showing how we could use, use genetic algorithms to evolve computer programs. And um, that, uh, these, these separate streams of um, invention are now sort of lumped together and, and the field is called evolutionary computation. And needless to say, there's been a lot of recombination between these different origins.